Okay, so we'll make a start. Uh, today I'm going to finish off all the phase transformations uh, and we're going to do perlite, which is the last of these uh, transformations. And perlite, as you can see, is all about diffusion, but it's unique amongst all the phases that we've treated so far that you have two phases growing at the same time from the parent phase. So you have ferrite and cementite growing together cooperatively from the parent phase. So on the time temperature transformation diagram, obviously because this is a transformation which requires diffusion, it will happen at higher temperatures, above around 600 degrees centigrade at a reasonable rate. Of course, you can get it forming at a lower temperature, but the rate of transformation will be very, very slow. So for example, in a 0.4 carbon and 3 manganese and 2 silicon steel, it took me 45 days to begin to produce perlite at 450 degrees centigrade. Yeah? So when diffusion is very slow, low temperatures, its rate of reaction will be incredibly slow, especially if you are below about 600 degrees centigrade. So there are two conditions you require to form perlite. First, that the carbon concentration of the austenite must be sufficient to allow both, uh, both ferrite and cementite to grow simultaneously. And secondly, that the temperature must be high enough to allow uh, diffusion to happen. So we'll just write that down. So there are two conditions. needed for perlite to form. Number one is that everything diffuses during the growth of perlite. Iron atoms, carbon atoms and any alloying elements that you can care to think about. There is never a case where there is para equilibrium. In other words, you simply do not get the case where substitutional alloying elements do not partition during the growth of perlite. So the first is that there must be sufficient uh, diffusion. There must be sufficient diffusion. Generally, at a reasonable rate, that means you'll be at temperatures above 600 degrees centigrade. So, approximately 600 greater than 600 degrees centigrade. So, iron atoms, carbon atoms, and manganese, or whatever you have in your material, will need to partition during the growth of perlite. And the second is that the conditions must be such that both cementite and ferrite can precipitate from the austenite. So it must be possible for alpha and theta to precipitate simultaneously from austenite. Now I explained to you that perlite happens in the vast majority of steels that are produced every year, but it's usually there in combination with ferrite because the vast majority of steels that we make are fairly low strength. Yeah? So most of the steels that go into high-rise buildings and so on they are of the order of 400 to 500 megapascals in strength. And similarly, when you make bridges, the decks and so on, are fairly low strength uh, steels. However, there are certain steels which are fully perlitic and are incredibly strong. So, 
This is what uh, a partially transformed specimen of perlite looks like. You see these nodules or what we call colonies of perlite, which on a microscopic scale consist of uh, cementite and ferrite growing together from austenite. And this rope here is one of the strongest steels available. You know, the strength typically is between two and a half to three and a half gigapascals. So all the suspension bridges, etc., contain lots and lots of perlitic wire, which you transform at a low temperature and then you draw it out to increase the strength further. Drawing means cold deformation to stretch it out and work hard in it and make the structure even finer to get very high strength. And in principle, you should be able to get to five gigapascals, okay? But you require the ability to draw the wire a great deal. And that means you have to have very pure steel. So generally speaking, the strongest of uh, perlitic steel wires is of the order of three gigapascals. The stuff that you see on suspension bridges, on cables uh, and cranes and so forth. So that can be incredibly strong because you can make the spacing between the cementite and ferrite very fine indeed. I'll give you some examples of that later on. But first, let's go into the theory of the perlite transformation. And let me begin by a question. What is the condition which ensures that you can precipitate both cementite and ferrite from austenite? Yep. So you've got to be able to precipitate both cementite and ferrite. Yeah? Don't worry, just take a guess, you know, don't worry about getting things wrong. I often do get things wrong. Yeah, remember you corrected my mathematics. So, uh, this is what the iron carbon phase diagram looks like, roughly. The carbon temperature. So this is uh, austenite, ferrite plus austenite, austenite plus cementite. And the concentration here is about 0 0.8 weight percent. So, I repeat my question. What is the condition that allows both ferrite and cementite to precipitate simultaneously from austenite? Right, so... Uh, the concentration uh, has to be at this eutectoid point where all three phases can coexist in equilibrium. Okay? So that temperature is about 723 degrees centigrade. But let me ask you then, is it the case that I can only produce a ferrit, uh, fully perlitic steel when my carbon concentration is the eutectoid composition. So, what do I need to do to represent that on this diagram? See, the condition is as follows. If I want to precipitate cementite from austenite, then my alloy must lie in the gamma plus theta phase field, right? If I want to precipitate ferrite from austenite, then my alloy must lie in the alpha plus gamma phase field, yeah? But if I want to precipitate all three, then on this equilibrium phase diagram, there's only one point where all three phases are in equilibrium, and that's this eutectoid. However, if I extrapolate these phase boundaries to lower temperatures, okay? So that's an extrapolation then any alloy lying in this shaded region can form a fully perlitic structure, okay? Because any alloy in that region is supersaturated with respect to ferrite and cementite, right? It's both in the alpha plus uh, gamma and gamma plus theta phase fields. So this region is known as the Hultgren extrapolation, the Hultgren extrapolation 
So even if I have an alloy which has only 0.4 weight percent carbon, if I supercool it, the austenite sufficiently, it will come within that extrapolated region and I can make a fully politic steel, right? So what will be the difference between a fully politic 0.4 weight percent carbon steel and a fully politic 0.8 weight percent carbon steel? What do you expect to see as the difference between 0.4 and 0.8 weight percent carbon fully politic steel? Exactly right. The amount of cementite will be much smaller in the 0.4 weight percent carbon steel because carbon, uh, cementite comes from carbon. So all you do is you increase the spacing between the lamellae yeah, so that the volume fraction of cementite is consistent with the concentration. And similarly, if I raise my carbon concentration to one weight percent, then I will get much more cementite than I would with a 0.8 carbon steel in a fully politic case. Okay? So that's very good. Uh, what this diagram also tells us is that if I have a composition, uh, let's say 0.8 weight percent, that is my C bar, then the equilibrium concentration in the ferrite which grows from cementite will be given by the extrapolated alpha plus gamma phase boundary and the equilibrium composition of the cementite will be the extrapolated gamma plus zeta phase boundary. Okay? So we use the same terminology as before, the C gamma theta and C gamma alpha for the equilibrium compositions. So this is a, a nicely drawn diagram where you can see that if I'm forming perlite at this low temperature, well below the eutectoid temperature, then the composition of the austenite which is in contact with cementite will be given by an extrapolation of the gamma plus zeta phase boundary and the composition of the austenite which is in contact with ferrite will be higher given by the extrapolation of the gamma plus alpha phase field. So if you've got two phases growing from austenite, then carbon will tend to diffuse in the austenite which is in contact with ferrite towards the austenite which is in contact with cementite because cementite is absorbing that carbon, right? So this is a, a schematic diagram of perlite growth which is, uh, I think it's given in your notes somewhere. Uh, where we have these lamellae of cementite and lamellae of ferrite when we look on a fine enough scale. And this is the parent austenite. And the two phases are growing together in such a way, in an iron carbon steel, in such a way that the average composition of the perlite is the same as the average composition of the austenite. So what does that tell you about the growth rate? If the average composition of the perlite is the same as that of the austenite, then what does that tell you about the growth rate? Um, we haven't got any alloying additions other than carbon. What, how do you expect the growth rate to vary with time? Yeah, it will be uh, constant because there's no change in the composition of the austenite as the perlite grows. The average composition of the perlite is the same as that of the austenite. So we expect to derive an equation where the growth rate is constant. Okay? Okay, so bear that diagram in mind. Uh, the term S here is what we call the interlamellar spacing and S alpha and S theta clearly depend on the amount of carbon you have in your steel because that is related to the volume fraction of cementite, right? So we are mostly interested in this interlamellar spacing and the way in which perlite grows is that the carbon that is rejected by the ferrite diffuses towards the cementite which is absorbing the carbon and you can see that the diffusion path unlike all the transformations that we've discussed 
so far. The diffusion part is parallel to the transformation front. The carbon is going from the ferrite towards the cementite. Okay? Okay, so let's derive the growth rate of perlite. So I can do this in two ways. I can work out the growth rate of the ferrite. I can work out the growth rate of cementite. It doesn't matter, does it? Because they are both growing at the same rate, right? So supposing we focus on the cementite, then um, the V, which is the velocity of growth, So the velocity times the rate at which the cementite is absorbing carbon because there will be a concentration profile. This is C bar. This is the composition in the austenite which is in contact with the cementite. And this is the composition of the cementite which is in contact with austenite. So here we have cementite and here we have gamma. And as this interface advances, the cementite will be absorbing that much carbon. Okay? So I can write that the velocity times C theta gamma minus C gamma theta. Okay? That's the rate at which cementite is absorbing carbon. Okay. So this is the rate at which cementite absorbs carbon. That must be equal to the flux that is coming from the ferrite to the cementite. Yeah? So that must be equal to the diffusion coefficient okay, so we have the diffusion coefficient times the flux from the ferrite to the cementite. In other words the austenite that is in contact with the ferrite so this is C gamma alpha minus C gamma theta divided by the diffusion distance, which I will call phi into S. Okay? So phi S is the diffusion distance. And S is the interlamellar spacing. Ferrite here, cementite and ferrite, alpha, theta and alpha and the interlamellar spacing here is S and the reason why I'm using this uh, parameter phi is because diffusion distance is not exactly S, you know, it could be from the middle of the ferrite to the cementite, in which case it would be half, but you need to think a bit more carefully because diffusion is happening from every point on the ferrite towards the cementite. Okay, so it will be some fraction of S. Everyone happy with that? Yeah. So we have a very simple equation that the rate at which cementite is absorbing carbon from the austenite here is equal to the diffusion coefficient of carbon in the austenite times the flux from the ferrite towards the cementite. Okay? So the concentration in the austenite next to the ferrite is greater than the concentration in the austenite next to the cementite and therefore you get a flux parallel to the interface. Okay? <coughs>
So we can simply write the velocity is equal to the diffusion coefficient divided by phi times s into c gamma alpha minus c gamma theta divided by c theta gamma minus c gamma theta. So once again, we have terms from the phase diagram. Okay, so all the thermodynamics is taken care of. Uh, they see the solubilities of carbon in ferrite, which is in contact with austenite, the solubility of carbon in cementite, which is in contact with the austenite. And we have the interlamellar spacing, and we have a diffusion coefficient. Why isn't the volume fraction, uh, the average carbon concentration in there? It determines the interlamellar spacing, doesn't it? Yeah? So it's implicitly in, in this. You know, it determines the thickness of the cementite relative to the thickness of the ferrite. So, uh, there's no time-dependent term here, so the growth rate will be constant. So, it's a constant growth rate. Okay, let me just plot what that graph looks like. So if I plot the velocity versus the interlamellar spacing, then I get a curve which looks like this. Okay. As the interlamellar spacing decreases, the velocity increases indefinitely because the diffusion distance decreases. Yeah? The diffusion is parallel to the transformation front, so if you decrease the interlamellar spacing, then the diffusion distance decreases. So, can you see that there is a problem here? Which, exactly the same problem that we had with Weidmann Sadden ferrite. I don't actually have a unique velocity here, right? Why is that? Yeah? Yeah. You know, when we grow perlite, we are creating ferrite cementite interface, aren't we? And that is a cost which we haven't accounted for. Okay? So let's just quickly work out how much interface we are creating. So if I take a cube of perlite, and let's say the side is A, And I have a lamella of cementite. And the spacing here is the interlamella spacing. Then the volume of that cube is simply A cubed, right? Yeah. So the volume is equal to A cubed. And the amount of area uh, between the cementite and ferrite is A cubed, 2A cubed upon S. Okay. Now, how do I get that? Well, the area of the lamella here, the face is A squared, right? And the number of these lamella I have per unit length is A divided by S, right? S is the interlamella spacing. If I divide A by S, I get the number of lamella I have in the cube. But we have two interfaces per lamella, this side and that side. And therefore, we have a factor of 2 here. 
So if I cancel out the terms which are common, then that comes to 2 upon S, which is equal to the amount of surface per unit volume. So this is the amount of theta alpha interface per unit volume. Actually, I've derived this uh, in a little bit of a simple way, but this relationship is generally true that if you measure a mean linear intercept for a grain size, then the amount of grain boundary area per unit volume is 2 divided by the mean linear intercept. Okay? Right, so we know how much surface we have created as we've grown uh, the perlite. So the amount of free energy that's consumed in creating the cementite ferrite interface is delta G, and we'll call it I, is the energy consumed in creating theta alpha interfaces which is equal to uh, 2 upon s which is the amount of surface per unit volume multiplied by the interfacial energy okay so sigma is interfacial energy per unit area. So the units of delta G i, which is the cost of creating those interfaces, are joules per meter cubed. Okay, because sigma is joules per meter squared, and s is a meter. Therefore, when I do 2 sigma upon s, that gives me the amount of energy locked up in interfaces inside the perlite. And that's going to take that's going to reduce the driving force for transformation. So if delta G, if that is the total chemical free energy change, then the actual driving force is equal to delta G T minus two sigma upon s. Okay, so this is the actual the free energy change. Now when we get to a particular interlamellar spacing which we'll call S with a subscript C, a critical spacing all of the free energy is used up in creating interfaces, so delta G will be zero. Okay? So at a critical spacing SC, at critical spacing SC, delta G equals zero, and we get delta G T will be equal to 2 sigma upon SC. So I can rewrite delta G is equal to 2 sigma into 1 upon SC minus 1 upon S. So SC is simply the interlamellar spacing where all of the driving force is used up in creating interfaces. And delta G over delta G total is equal to um, 
So 1 minus SC upon S is the fraction of the driving force available to drive the interface. Everyone happy with that? Okay, so if I just take the equation we derived earlier and multiply it by the term in square brackets, then we, are, we have taken into account the cost of creating interfaces because you know that velocity is proportional to driving force in the first approximation, right? So if I now rewrite the equation that we had on the previous page, this equation here, then I will get the velocity is equal to um, the diffusion coefficient divided by phi into s times c gamma alpha minus c gamma theta divided by c theta gamma minus c gamma theta. Okay. And then multiply that by 1 minus sc upon s. Okay, so all we've done is we've taken that previous equation, multiplied it by the fraction of free energy that's available to drive the pearl light. And if I plot this equation out, velocity versus s, then instead of getting a curve which looks, whoops a daisy, let me just get rid of that. Instead of this, which, which is not correct, we will get a curve which goes to a maximum. Okay. And the growth rate is zero when the spacing is a critical spacing. It goes to a maximum. So the perlite will try to find an optimum spacing. Now, in the case of Wiedmann-Stein ferrite, we picked the maximum as the growth rate, right? Because the experimentally measured values of the growth rate of Wiedmann-Stein ferrite were slightly higher than the maximum. This is not actually the case for perlite, but we have two choices for picking a velocity, okay? So we could simply assume S corresponds to maximum velocity. And in this case, you know, S will be equal to twice SC. You can prove that for yourself. And the second is the growth occurs at a rate which dissipates the maximum amount of free energy. So the maximum free energy dissipation rate. Yes. Assume S which leads to maximum free energy dissipation rate. So the most rapid decrease in free energy, and you remember this equation where we had T into, um, I will use different terminology here, uh, temperature times the rate of entropy production, rate of entropy production equals a flux times a force. You remember that, right? Yeah. Now, if we are doing this transformation isothermally, 
then the rate of entropy production times temperature is also the free energy dissipation rate. Yeah? So there's some logic in choosing this. My, my own favorite is the second condition where we get the maximum free energy dissipation rate. And experiments seem to confirm that. But as I explained to you last time, there is no fundamental theory which will tell you that this should be picked or that should be picked. The theory that is there is simply too complicated to represent real situations. Okay? So if you want to do a calculation, your safe bet is to pick a spacing S which leads to the maximum rate of free energy dissipation. Okay? Even if you try to do calculations of solidification, you know, the rate of dendrite growth is not what you get, but you get the rate of dendrite growth as a function of the dendrite tip radius. So you have to have some condition to pick the actual velocity at which the material grow, uh, at which the transformation happens. Okay, so that's uh, uh, enough of uh, theory. And this is what an actual growth rate calculation would look like for an iron carbon steel where the growth rate of the perlite is of the order of, you know, 20 micrometers per second and the interlamellar spacing is below a micrometer. Okay? That's quite typical. Now, We have dealt with perlite growth with diffusion happening in the austenite parallel to the transformation front. But there's also a grain bound, uh, a bound interfaces here, right? And interfaces are easy diffusion paths. So we can help this parallel flux by also diffusing through the boundary at a much greater rate. Yeah? So all we have to do is also add another term which represents the flux through the grain, uh, through the boundary between the perlite, uh, between the perlite and the austenite. So there's also an additional diffusion path which we haven't taken into account. Okay. And just like we had the flux going through the volume, so this is the volume diffusion coefficient and this term, and then we had the uh, diffusion distance. Uh, we have a grain boundary diffusion coefficient and a grain boundary thickness and this term here is exactly the same as that because we are assuming that the equilibrium there is also the same. But this diffusion coefficient times the boundary thickness which is what you can measure experimentally uh, is actually a much faster diffusion path. So when you go down in temperature Boundary diffusion will dominate over volume diffusion, okay? Because volume diffusion becomes much slower. The activation energy for volume diffusion is much greater than through the boundary. Boundaries are loosely packed structures. A flux not only has an, uh, a diffusion coefficient in it, but also an area through which the flux happens, right? And the area through which the boundary flux happens is much smaller than the volume of the material ahead of it. So as you raise the temperature, even though the volume diffusion coefficient is smaller than the boundary diffusion coefficient, the area through which volume diffusion can happen is greater. And therefore, at high temperatures, volume diffusion will dominate. At low temperatures, boundary diffusion will dominate. So let me just uh, write that down. So, the transformation front itself front is a diffusion path So, when we had the equation that the velocity times the rate at which the cementite is absorbing carbon. Sorry, that's uh, 
minus is equal to the diffusion coefficient in the austenite times um, C alpha gamma minus C theta gamma. No. So it's C gamma alpha minus C gamma theta. Divided by S. And there was a phi here. So this is through the volume of austenite. We simply add another term here, which is the grain boundary diffusion coefficient times the thickness of the boundary times the same gamma alpha minus C gamma theta divided by phi into S. So dB has units of meters per second and dB times delta, which is the thickness of the boundary, has units of meter squared per second. So delta is the thickness of the boundary. And the diffusion coefficient through the volume of the austenite has units of meter squared per second. So you can see that dV times delta has the same units as dV, the volume diffusion coefficient. So I'm not going to go through, you know, including the interface energy term and so on. It's fairly easy to add on a second diffusion path. And by doing this, you don't need to say, okay, my reaction is interface controlled or it's volume diffusion controlled. This equation automatically tells you how much flux goes through the boundary and how much flux goes through the volume as you alter the transformation temperature. Okay. Right, so this is the same thing expressed again, that we have our flux through the volume and the flux through the boundary. And the red points here represent experimental measurements on iron carbon alloys. This is the calculated growth rate uh, as a function of temperature, assuming that diffusion only happens through the volume of the material. And this curve here represents the growth rate calculated assuming that diffusion only happens through the boundary and the curve in the middle allows both of them to happen automatically. Okay. So you can clearly see that at low temperatures the proper model is consistent with all the points uh, and it's closer to the interface controlled diffusion. Okay because most of the flux goes through the interface at low temperatures, whereas at high temperatures you have much more austenite ahead of the transformation front, so you have a greater area through which diffusion can happen, and therefore volume diffusion dominates the growth rate. But if you use the proper equation, you don't need to worry about whether it's volume diffusion controlled or interface diffusion controlled. You just add the two fluxes together. Okay. So it's possible to calculate the growth rate of uh, perlite using this uh, simple theory. The only problem that remains, which I'm not comfortable with, and which many people are not comfortable with, is how to select the interlamellar spacing from the function of velocity versus the spacing. If you have to use the maximum free energy dissipation rate as a choice for picking S. So th this is just uh, telling you the ratio of the volume flux through the boundary flux is greater at higher temperatures because you have a greater amount of austenite through which diffusion can happen than through the boundary. Now there are papers in the literature which propose also a third diffusion path because diffusion in ferrite is much faster than in austenite, diffusion of carbon. So it's possible that carbon from the austenite gets into the ferrite and then gets to the cementite. 
what that would predict is that the cementite thickness increases behind the transformation front and there is no evidence that that is happening but supposing you needed to do this calculation you just add a third term yeah so it's not a problem but it's not believable that you are getting thickening of cementite behind the transformation front when we quench the specimen and we look at the shape of the cementite is more or less parallel okay Right, we can also take into account ternary systems, just like we did for allotriomorphic ferrite. Uh, in this case, in the case of where you have added manganese or substitutional solutes, you can forget, more or less, about volume diffusion. The difference between volume diffusion and boundary diffusion is so large that for all of these cases, it's really boundary diffusion control growth. Okay? Substitution of solutes are really happy to be and move about in the boundary compared with the volume of the austenite. So, the fact that they have to diffuse dramatically slows down the perlite reaction. Okay? And here's the case for chromium. Okay, let me just show you. Um, I explained to you that strength depends on interlamellar spacing, right? And we can reduce that spacing by drawing the steel. But obviously, if you start with a finer spacing, then you end up an even finer spacing when you draw the wire out, right? How can I reduce the interlamellar spacing? Okay, so uh, I'll just move back there. Forget this slide. What in your equations allows you to reduce the interlamellar spacing? by phase transformation. Yeah. You know what limits the interlamellar spacing, right? What limits the finest spacing that I can get? What determines the value of the critical interlamellar spacing at which growth rate becomes zero? Hmm? Uh, mm, why does the growth rate become zero at a certain interlamellar spacing? Go, go ahead. No, no. It can't have a time defense, yeah? Um, why does the growth rate become zero when the spacing becomes a critical value SC? Yeah. So, when the spacing becomes so fine that all the driving force is used up in creating interfaces, you get a zero growth rate. So, how can I make it even finer? I provide extra driving force, right? Now, one way of providing extra driving force is to use a magnetic field. So this is now coming back to your area of expertise, okay? Uh, why would a magnetic field increase the driving force for the transformation of austenite? So if I take austenite and impose a magnetic field on it, why would that increase the driving force for transformation? So generally speaking, austenite is not ferromagnetic, right? Yeah, ferrite and cementite actually, both can be ferromagnetic. So if I impose a magnetic field, it favors the formation of ferromagnetic phases. So that increases the driving force. Yeah? Uh, so by applying a very large magnetic field, uh, this slide shows you some work we did a few years ago. This is the steel transformed without a magnetic field. As soon as you apply a magnetic field, you form perlite instead. Okay? Because it's favoring the formation of perlite. And if I show you a transmission electron micrograph, you get incredibly fine perlite. So this is 
a spacing of about 50 nanometers. This had not been drawn, it's just by phase transformation. All right? Now, I'm asking you again, 30 Tesla magnetic field, is that easy to produce? Very, very difficult, it's hugely expensive, right? Is there any other way in which I can increase the driving force? You'd require the power of a small city to consistently produce a field of 30 Teslas, right? How can you alter the free energy difference between austenite and ferrite normally without magnetic fields? Hmm? Temperature. temperature, but we have a limit because diffusion must happen. Yeah. So we already actually, the wires are already transformed at about 450 degrees C by patenting. They call it a patenting process where you go from a hot to a lead bath or, or some other bath. But um, what about alloying? Yeah. What elements can I add to the austenite which will make the ferrite more stable? Hmm? Aluminium or cobalt, those are basically the only two alloying elements which will increase the free energy change. So this is completely without a magnetic field, right? And here we also have a spacing of the order of 50 nanometers by altering the chemical composition of the steel just by natural cooling you get to 50 nanometer spacing so this paper will come out soon in scripta material yeah? I'm not saying this is practical because cult is expensive yeah? but it's interesting you know to start with a spacing which is 50 nanometers you you know we don't even know how much we could get to if we now wire draw it so Polite, oops, Polite hasn't had much attention in recent years, but it could have some uh, major technological advances if we can create, without wire drawing, a fine structure. Okay? Because then afterwards, if you draw it, you'll get it even finer. Okay? That's all for today.